Good afternoon. Thank you, I appreciate that. And welcome to your Profectus Business Symposium. We thank you for joining us and embarking on this adventure together. Profectus is Latin for progress. Our core focus is to provide expertise and thought leadership that allows us to gather as a business community, comprehend, and take tangible action with key business topics that allow us to navigate our companies towards success, stabilization, and scalability. Are you interested in that? I, I can't hear you. Are you interested in that? All right, good. All right, good. My name is John Lanius. I'm your moderator. Pursuant to my background, I'm the executive vice president of Vidzu Media, and my career spans government, education and training, and all forms of media. One of the distinctions of a Perfectus Business Symposium is that we follow a radio style format. What does this mean for you? This means that our time together is enjoyable to listen to, informative, engages you in the conversation as soon as possible, and we start and end on time. Said another way, almost the entirety of the Perfectus experience will be driven by questions asked by you, the audience as it should be. So bring your questions about those things that most vex you about lead generation, sales conversion, revenue creation, profitability, or anything else related to sales. Today's topic, oper operationalizing the sales function, growth via predictable revenue. Op operationalizing the sales effort so that it produces revenue efficiently, predictability, and cost effectively for the company is a challenge that many organizations struggle to solve continuously. Why is this difficult? Why do organizations keep running into impediments to success? This panel seeks to address this by discussing the impact of the emerging discipline sales operations and how, and how bringing scientific management practice to the sales effort allows companies to overcome the challenge of producing profitable and more predictable revenue. Today, our panel captain is Ryan Bresch. And our curated panelists are Tara Kinney, Greg Son Sonnenberg, and Eric Morse. Ryan Bresch is the Chief Operating Officer for Atomic Revenue. Atomic Revenue focuses on the unique discipline of end-to-end -end revenue operations, with emphasis on aligning the marketing, sales, and customer operations infrastructure to drive more predictable, profitable revenue. Ryan provides companies with integrated, well-aligned insights for increasing lead generation and sales conversion capability, as well as providing accurate, scenario-based financial operating modeling to understand how profit actually occurs in the business. With 15 plus years sales management and sales operations experience, Ryan has successfully led sales groups consisting of 50 plus salespeople to number one performance in both sales and customer satisfaction outcomes. Finally, SBM Magazine also selected him as the 2017 recipient of Top 100 People to Know and Succeed in Business. Tara Kinney. Tara has nearly 20 years of experience developing, leading, and managing revenue production teams for SMB, nonprofit, enterprise, and international business spaces. Tara focuses on positioning the necessary people, processes, and data production efforts required to effectively create innovative solutions that address complex lead generation and revenue problems. Tara also works to align the operations of both marketing and sales so they work in concert with each other towards unified goals, which produce more profitable outcomes. Tara currently serves as CEO of Atomic Revenue, a revenue operations firm dedicated to operationalizing enterprise level marketing and sales best practices and bringing those practices and solutions to the SMB market. Greg Sonnenberg is currently VP of Sales of, at Mercy Technology Services, part of Mercy Hospital of St. Louis, Missouri. Formerly, Greg worked and led sales efforts as Director of Systems Integrators, managing cloud providers for F5 Networks, one of Seattle, Washington's most prominent companies and success stories. Greg spearheaded the movement to an as-a-service SaaS model from a legacy HW model for F5 managing cloud providers. Greg is extremely well versed in the practice of sales operations and the science of sales management practice. With 25 years of experience managing and leading sales teams and developing sales operational processes in the highly demanding and aggressive IT market segment, Greg is extremely well positioned to answer any and all questions around sales organization, support, management, operations, and sales enablement. And finally, Eric Morse. Eric Morris is the CEO of Sales Result Incorporated, headquartered out of Seattle. 
Washington. Eric is one of the foremost principal pioneers in shaping the discipline of sales operations and sales enablement, both in the United States and EMEA countries. Eric's impressive roster of experience and clients include building and, optimi and optimizing sales processes and operations for Google in early stage and IMAX as most prominent. He is one of the leading voices defining the science of sales management practice today. Eric has already accumulated almost 20 years of experience in what is still an emerging interdisciplinary field with extensive vertical expertise supporting sales teams and process creation in the high-tech financial services, professional services, manufacturing, and wholesale sectors, and he is our featured panelist. Please please give him a round of applause. So we'll now move to points of view. Each panelist will share his or her one minute point of view for, opera, for operationalizing the sales function, growth via predictable revenue. And we'll begin with our panel captain, Ryan Bresch. So <coughs> my, you know, my, my point of view on this is actually gonna be you know, shortened because I, I'm really eager to, to take your questions. But you know, I think that sales has, has traditionally been thought of as a very you know, people-centric, very people, you know, you know, very leadership-based um, practice. It's, you know, it's, it's, you know, and the thing that we're uncovering with regard to, to, to sales and, and sales operations is that it, there really is a lot of scientific management process behind that. And so as you're asking questions, there's a lot of things in, in sales management that interrelate to, to each other. And the things that we talk about are not just standalone topics, but they have to be taken in context with, with everything else that goes into to operationalizing you know, effective revenue generation. Thank you, Ryan. Tara? So my general thought on the topic goes along with a line on our website, which is great parts don't mean great results. You can have a lot of really good things going on, but if you don't have a process for customer acquisition and profitable revenue production, that all of those great parts are accountable to fulfilling their role in the process, then you will not produce profitable revenue results. You will continue to struggle. And so for us, it's knowing the process, what everyone's role in the process is, how to measure people's performance in contributing to the outcomes that the company is trying to achieve, and then enabling people to perform the best, the best using their best skills in fulfilling their role in the process. So if great parts don't mean great results, then don't slam a bunch of good things together and expect it to work. It takes a little more management than that. <laughs> Thank you, Tara. Greg? Uh, my point of view is this, is sales has evolved over the couple of decades I've been involved in it. <laughs> Initially, I think it was, it was kind of perceived as a somewhat of a black art or uh, a science in that that's a sales organization. Just give them a number, they're going to chase it. Don't ask them how they get it, how they got to that number, uh, and why is one individual successful and not the other individual. I think it's morphed over those couple of decades into, uh, to follow on to what Tara said, is that it's much more process oriented now in that you can assign metrics to the different sales individuals to track what they're doing, why they're doing it, how they're doing it, and what's successful and what's not successful, and where do you invest in people or where do you divest in people. Got it. Thanks, Rick. Eric? So thanks for having me. Um, so I'm a little opposite on this on the starting minute. Don't ever lose the connection with your people. There's no one tool that is going to solve all your problems whether it's forecasting accuracy, whether it's funnel development, whatever. The day you get your hands or you're disconnected from your people, it's over. That's my opening comment. Thank you, panelists, for your point of view. So now I'll ask all of you, what is your point of view? So here's what I know about people, is that you came here today with a particular expectation. If you don't get to the heart of whatever it is that you're struggling with, you're gonna leave here not satisfied. So it could be areas of lead generation, sales conversion, revenue creation, profitability. But as I talked about at the, at the beginning of the Perfectus panel, all of this now generates with you. 
Much like a radio show, where we're listening, we're moving along, and all of a sudden we go to the phones. So not that we're going to the phones necessarily, it's a little, it's a little more intimidating because with radio, people don't see you. So who would like to begin with a question? Not all at once, don't overwhelm me. Come on, somebody has a question. We've got Jason in the back, here in the front. Jason, hold on, let me get your mic. Uh, hold on, Jason. Yeah, great. No, I'm not intimidated at all. Uh, my question uh, is to Eric, uh, I think. Um, and it's, um, it's about the investment that you make in media and, uh, and the changing media landscape and how you judge ROI as it, as it um, pertains to sales. So it's, it's a real interesting thing. And we are like everybody else in this room. We try and make a buck and we try and grow, right? And the difference today is that most of the consumers, we are all B2B, we do not do any B2C, right? But most of the consumers are very educated by the time they pick up the phone, right? So we've spent a lot of money on our front end using social media and what we have learned, the best thing to do is give, 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 and give. If you educate your prospect, if you give to your prospect, if you constantly keep them or adding value to the prospect, that's the way you go. Cold calling by itself doesn't really work anymore. But cold calling in a sequence of 12 touch points works because it's not a cold call anymore. It's a warm call. So embrace social media, but more importantly, when you embrace it, you better have a flipping plan. Don't just say to the, your digital person, I want a 12 touch, whatever, you know, nurturing program to convert my leads. Think through it a lot, right? Because the more you think through it, your better lead conversion is gonna be. I don't know if that answered your question or not, but, uh, yes? Gentleman in the third row, had his hand. So in a lot of disciplines, uh, people say that if you can't measure something, you can't control it. The points that you guys have made indicates it's still very much a people-oriented business. When I've looked into CRM, for instance, to try and get a handle on all this, the biggest obstacle is getting the salespeople in the field to actually use a system so you can find out what's going on. What is your opinion on how best to integrate and um, roll out a program like that? I'll take this one. <laughs> um, CRM selection and integration might be the bane of my professional career because it's not fun. <laughs> but at the same time, it is critically important because it's this underlying foundation for the process that you expect people to perform. And so a key first step that most people don't take is to actually define the process and all of the people who need access to that same pool of data and they all need to have buy-in and input to their requirements and they need to know that this tool is in place to be helpful to them, not to be an administrative burden, not for people to spy on their activity and make sure that they're doing what they're supposed to. And by creating that buy-in and that process at the beginning, you learn requirements and things that the management team would never tell you, but the people in the field who actually have to perform the work, they'll tell you what they need and what they would like to do and the things that they would like you to accommodate in the system. System. Then you select a system that meets the requirements, the top priority requirements of the company. From everybody from the operations, whether or not it needs to connect to QuickBooks or an ERP solution, or whether or not it needs to have marketing automation, um, those types of things are really important when you're selecting the system. And then the number one thing that I see when I'm fixing systems later is that people may have thought they took some of these steps and everyone agreed that they were going to deploy a system and then they put it in and they don't tailor the system to their process. They try to match their process to the CRM system. And therefore, you can't measure anything. The information you put in there is useless to measuring how you're producing revenue. You have to structure the CRM system to match your process and determine ahead of time what reports does your management team need to go over with your salespeople? What information and dashboards do your salespeople need to have easy access to contact information? Um, what types of data do you need to pull out of this? And all of that has to be built before you ever import the first list. 
Um, otherwise, later, it is a, it's like kicking a tin can down the road, and there's a lot of magnets on this road, and by the time you realize it's broken, you now have this expensive thing to fix versus this little tin can that you started with. <laughs> I'm trying to kind of riff off of you know something that Eric said, you know, is you know certainly we're going. I'm going to repeatedly emphasize process, 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 and a lot of, and a lot of answering your your questions. But you know, foremost, you know, there has to be an understanding that it is people that animate process. So one of the common things that I've seen, you know, in, 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 in numerous engagements is that the company sets their requirements for what they want the CRM to do, but they never enlist the salespeople, the people that actually have to use the system to find out what their needs, requirements are. And, you know, and then, you know, they act shocked when they get pushback from, from the sales, you know, from the salespeople that they don't want to use this, the, the system. I think that's, that is key, is in engaging the sales organization up front to be part of the whole CRM uh, decision process as to who they choose and what they implement. And in balancing, you know, you can put in a thousand different fields into a CRM and ask the, the reps to, to fill them out, but typically you're gonna get a bunch of trash, especially if it's pull downs, you'll be amazed as to the pull down ends up being the first one that they can click on, is what you're gonna get 90% of the time. The other thing I think is once they, you ask them, hey, look, you're not gonna burden them with all the administrative tasks, but actually if they understand how to use the system, it's gonna free them up to be in front of that customer and to be more um, productive for that customer or have a more, uh, well-defined message as opposed to just showing up and throwing up as I call it. I would also mention one other important piece to this, you know, now representing the marketing side of this picture, is that um, there's a lot of opportunity for marketing to support the sales team if that process is integrated in the CRM, but that buy-in has to be established beforehand Otherwise, there is a skepticism of whether or not I'm going to let another salesperson or the marketing team touch or contact my people in the system. And you have a natural deterrent of whether or not I'm going to put my information in there because if there's not a clear path of marketing has access to the same data and they're running campaigns to my people and I don't know what those are, you're going to have an upset sales team. And so I'm working with a couple of companies right now that marketing is trying to support the sales effort using the contacts in the CRM, but the CRM was never structured for that. And so there's a lot of resistance. Let's go to the gentleman in the second row. Uh, hold on, we got, uh, Oh, back here, okay, great, got it. Jim, yep. I got you next. Okay, thank you. Um, I think it's safe to say that um, most of the, the members of this audience are with or represent smaller organizations. And um, one of our great challenges is how we help our organizations or our clients um, gain access to much larger organizations, Fortune 1000 organizations. How do you build a process around helping you gain access to those types of organizations for a smaller company? How do you create value for those companies? It's it kind of it, to that. It goes back to what what pain. Well, you you may have uh, you may be able to create create value for them, but uh, how do you even get an opportunity to uh, present that as a as an uh, value to them? That's what we're looking for. I think one of one of the things we're finding. So I have two segments we sell to. We're very defined in who we sell. First segment is 10 to 30 or 50 million. We do not do startups, because why? Startup is looking at me to answer an accounting question. I'm the last person you ever want to ask for an accounting question, right? So we don't do startups, but we do 10 to 30, 50 million, and then we do 90 to a quarter of a billion, right? The, the whole thing around defining your market space, right? And what I find with the, you know, there's difference in, uh, how do I say it? Uh, your, your age these days, um, and I'm an old guy, I'm an old dude, man. Um, the younger people are willing to invest hugely in people. I mean, I, you wouldn't believe how many sales VPs we work with that have never been coached. 
But the younger people, the younger CEOs, I love them. They're willing to invest in process. They're willing to invest in CRM. They know that leadership has to buy into the CRM. They're willing to invest in coaching, right? And those are the things that I think are changing for the real positive. It's, it's, it's not just go make my number anymore. It's like, how do I help you be part of the executive team? How do I help you, how do I help coach you to be a better leader with these people? Because sales today, if you're running a 10 to $30 million company or 100 million, or I don't know what the audience is here, but it's a big responsibility. I, I go back to the gentleman's question about how do you get access to a Fortune 1000. I'd actually ask you a question is, why do you want to get access to that Fortune 1000? And it's, it's, I've seen it in the 30 plus years I've been doing that. People want to go chase a big logo to put up on a screen like this. Everybody's chasing that big logo, which typically means highly competitive, which it typically means high discounts, low margin. <laughs> if you're just looking for a logo, that's fine. You can do that, but I, you know, I would caution you to really analyze why you're chasing that logo and what you think you get out of it. Especially for small to medium companies to be chasing those, they're going to suck up a lot of time. And I'm not going to put anybody <clears throat> directly on the spot by making them stand up and state their value, but the question that you have to ask yourself is, can you clearly communicate what your value is to those larger customers, to those mid-sized customers, to even those smaller customers? If you can't do that, then think of yourself on the receiving end. If I'm XYZ Corporation, then why do I want to meet with you? I mean, you have to be able to, you know, first know what your value is, but then also communicate the value, your value in a substantive message, not necessarily a fancy graphical marketing, you know, you know, look at our pretty logo, you know, whatever message, but you know, really understand how is it that we can help this larger organization in a manner that not how you feel that they should receive you, but in a manner of, uh, that is actually of value to your customer, which is the difference between a product service driven sales process and one that is a buyer driven, which is all focused on not how do we you know, not, you know, how do we present our value or this is how you should look at us, but you know, again, how does the, the customer, large or small, you know, want to receive your value. I think another key piece of the operations that we haven't touched on yet is timeline and staying power. If you're a small company, those big accounts have a really long sales timeline. Do you have the financial staying power to stay viable for the amount of time it takes to close a large account? And they have all the leverage. So some of my smaller clients are actually moving very wisely into smaller clients than their current client base even. And these aren't big companies, but the smaller companies can make faster decisions. So they've got a shorter sales cycle, but also their terms of payment are better. And when you're a small company, that cash flow is really important. And those large companies, they have all the power for net net 200 days. So after you've delivered, you have the staying power to deliver now that you've gone through the long sales process. Gentleman here. Um, my question was going in prior, the step prior to before you get to a, a, a CRM or a sales system is how do you deal with the conflict between marketing and how marketing defines a marketing qualified lead and the sales force and how they define a sales qualified lead because salesmen typically say that's a garbage lead you're giving me marketing come on that person that's cold there's, there's nothing warm in there at all uh, so how do you work out the conflict or the difference between an MQL and SQL well, so this you can start building that's a system. That's a great question. So you can start building a system. Yeah. Watch how this gets answered. <laughs> so, well, I'm the marketing side, so let me do this. I did not know what sales operations was until I met Ryan and when he showed me the type of content that was being produced for the sales team to be able to qualify a lead, my question was why in the hell haven't you been giving this to the marketing department? Quite honestly, I, I might have used those words exactly. That she did. <laughs> 
But seriously, the sales team is the one talking to the customer. So when people come to me, like my marketing and sales team are disagreeing on the message, the interesting thing to me is always that they, they feel better about the marketing message. Well, it might look better, and it's being written by people who are professional writers, but the salespeople are actually talking to the customer. And that has to come together. So when I'm looking at building qualifications process for some of our clients, I'm starting with the sales team. What do you need to know before you talk to someone that you're assessing whether or not they're qualified? And I back it up based on whether or not the customer is going to provide that level of information to the marketing, and that would be marketing qualified, where's the customer then need to go to be sales qualified? Um, but it, it's one of those key areas that we're probably all going to have a different approach. <laughs> I tend to make it, turn it back around them and make it their problem. So I'll, in our organization, I make the marketing team go with the sales team on a quarterly basis to go to spend a, a week with them, you know, not the entire week, but take a week and do you know, five to seven sales calls. So they can understand you know, what a salesperson is encountering when they're out using their marketing content that they've generated. Likewise, I ask those sales individuals then to you know, provide productive and uh, feedback, constructive feedback to that marketing organization, not just hey, this is trash, okay, why is it trash? What would be helpful to you? And sit down, and they're, you know, they're, they're both part of that, uh, that, organiz that organization that meets on a, on a monthly basis to review the content, and whether it's you know, content you hand somebody, whether it's on the, the website or whatever it might be, to refresh it and refine it. And if I can riff off that for just a second, it's, you know, this is where process becomes important because when you have, you know, personality driven, you know, leadership in the, in the marketing and the sales function is if you have two strong people in both of those, there's the potential, the very real potential for them to, to clash. If you have one that's strong and then one that is more passive, then you have, you know, the, if it's the sales, you know, VP that's, that's strong, then they're railroading over the, the, the marketing function. And if it's, you know, if it's the VP of marketing that's strong and the salesperson that's passive or the sales VP that's passive, you know, then it's going the, the opposite way. And the thing is, is that, you know, is everybody has to understand that you're, you're, the goal of the organization is to accomplish the same result. You're on the same team. You're all pushing for the same revenue result. There has to be communication you know, between those. And you know, when you have a process that's helping to define that, that helps keep everyone you know, within boundaries and, then, and focused on a similar mission. This is a very uh, specific question for <laughs> my company, but feel free to make it general if, if uh, it's too specific. Opposite of the Fortune 1000 concept, we work with regional convenience store chains that have anywhere from 20 to 400 locations. A lot of these organizations are family-based, family-driven oil companies, if you will, and they're usually second or third generation of those family-driven, so they don't have as much uh, passion about the organization. What advice do you have as far as working with a family-based organization and selling into them that's more close-knit, more loyal, it's a little tougher to get into the inner circle? What kind of advice would you have for that kind of arena? So I've got uh, actually uh, a it's not my business. I have two brothers that have a family-owned business over in Southern Illinois, and their kids are coming into it. Um, you, it's a real challenge um, for them to transition out of it and to let the, the second generation take over it. Uh, what you see, though, is that second generation is much more apt to try new things. They're not, worried, they're not so worried about failing. So. I would tend to, depending on what your, your message is and your value prop is, I would tend to focus on the younger generation um, that are you know, going to be making those decisions and are heavy influence on the decisions. Now, they probably got it to go to you know, their father or whoever to get the, the sign off on it. But 
I know if you want to talk to my older brothers about some web-based marketing campaign or digital media, you'd lose them after those first two words. They'd have no idea what you're talking about. We do mobile apps, so yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah if you're mobile apps, both those, both my older brothers, that thing's kind of a door. They, it, they still use it as a phone. That's the primary use for it. And check the weather. <laughs> one, one other thing, I just finished a big gig in Midland, Texas. I've learned about Midland, Texas. It's the heart and soul of oil, right? And it's amazing. It's like when you first go there, it's like, why the hell are you here, right? And then you start to get to know and you, right? And the thing that I learned from those guys, and you know, the day I stop learning is the day I get out of this thing, right? But the, the thing I learned is they sell to a lot of these people. Right? It's not a one-touch thing. You got to earn your. I mean, this is, this is you know, consistent. Be consistent and never give up. I think there's a chart that says, you know, sales. Uh, you know, 80% of the salespeople quit after five calls or something, and and 80% of the sales are made after the. I don't know what the exact thing says. That would be my advice: is that you have a strict campaign on first, second, third, fourth, and fifth touches, and you do a lot of persona-based, you really understand who your buyers are, whether they're that first or second or third, and you know, messages to avoid and messages to leave and, and, and add value to them. But it, and you tweak, and tweak your message, whether you're talking to yeah. the owner who is, you know, first or second generation versus, you know, the 25-year-old who's the second or third generation. The other thing, too, is if you're talking about uh, those small type of companies and your mobile app, if you have a risk share model with them, that you're willing to put it in at little to no cost, but you got some type of metric to measure the value on it, and you're going to, you're, since it's a risk share, you're going to get more money on the back end than if you just sold it to them. I think the final point would be is, um, and I'm not saying you guys do this, I'm not saying anybody in this room does it, but one of the things we do in our audits that we see a lot are salespeople are like vomiting at the mouth about the features and benefits of what you're selling. <laughs> and they're not engaging the prospect. And they're not asking them, you know, what are you, you, know, what are you doing tonight? I mean, what, do you, you know, what kind of beer do you drink? I mean, they all drink beer in the oil country. Uh, <laughs> but, I mean, you gotta get to know these people. Right? And you got to find out what their business pains are. And because everybody in this room, does anybody not have a business pain? We all do, right? <laughs> so it's, I would suggest that you really get to know these people. Well, and to follow up on that, uh, I've, it's interesting. I've gone from, you know, strictly on the sales side, still, I'm still on the sales side, but because I'm part of, of an IT organization at Mercy, um, I've gotten brought into when other, you know, whether it's a Cisco, a NetApp, a VMware, an Oracle, Microsoft, whoever, comes in and pitches, you know, they've asked me to come in to look at their contracts and are we getting a fair price, is there a different way to structure it, whatnot. It amazes me the number of reps that show up and throw up. And the question that, that always dumbfounds me is they ask C the Gil, our CIO, what keeps you up at night? Oh gosh. You know. And I'm like, if you don't, you should be, you should know what's keeping him up at night. And by the way, that's a lazy question. If there ever was a, a sales question, what keeps you up at night? There's far more intelligent ways to basically work and, and you know, it also communicates that you don't really care about the customer. And, and with all the information that's just available via doing a simple Google search, you should you can show up with three or four things that you you can talk about and add some value to it. It always amazes me too. I make a point of handing the salesperson my card after they do their pre's and say, "If you have any information or question, call me." Nine out of ten never call me. The people that call me, you know, I will help them get intros into other parts of the organization. Tell them if I was you selling it here, here's where I would sell it. But just the simple of you know the eighty percent that oh, I heard a no or it's not a perfect fit, I move on to the next thing. And then the other thing is, is that your job as a salesperson isn't to go running around trying to convince people to take your, your services. Your job is to, to educate. And more and more, and Tara can probably speak to this, is that you know, customers in a buyer-driven sales process enter buying windows, right? 
And that means that they're just not waiting to sit around to take your call and then all of a sudden you magically convince them to take your solution and, you know, and they all live happily ever after. It's, you know, and then maybe if you could speak a little bit more to, to, to buying windows and what you need to, to prepare for. Yeah, I mean, there's tons of statistics about it, but in today's buyer market, most of the statistics say that 57% or more of the buying decision is made before they'll even talk to you. So you leave them a message, you send them an email, before they'll even have a meeting with you, they've already made a majority of the decision based on self-educating. So you better be sure that all of your digital information that's out there that they can research you is good because it needs to validate your message. And if they can't validate your message, then you're just some stranger off the street peddling something else. And there's no reason for them to engage with you because they want to learn more before they have the conversation. So they're an informed buyer. But the other thing too is when you're selling into privately held business, especially a family business, uh, Eric made the best point is it has to be about the relationship. They're buying based on relationship and trust and they do business with their family. There's not outside owners that are holding them accountable like a board of directors of people in other businesses. It's the family and so you have to be part of the family and you're not going to get the sale if they don't feel like you're part of the family. <laughs> Thank you. I think Ron was next. Okay, we'll a, go there. Yeah, I have a question. I wanted to go back to the selling to the Fortune 1000 customers. So what, my, what I sell is most valuable to those type of customers. I'm a very small business. So I've, so far my business has been grown by partnering with people as middlemen that every time it goes through that, they take so much money out of it. By the time it gets to me, there's not a whole lot left. But I have these customers in the Fortune 1000, and I have people all around me that call me the middlemen looking for this. I'm like, so I tried to engage the customers directly, and I had one just this week. I called, picked up the phone, and called, and I was sent over to SAP, some Aruba or something like that procurement system that they have that I have to go register as a vendor before they'll ever even talk to me. And yet, that's a big challenge for me to go through that, and yet I still get calls every day about this opportunity, and I cannot reach them to do that. And that's, going, that's who all my customers are, and it's, it's a huge problem for me. And so all I can do now is stay with all these people in the middle to take all my money and just, they, and they don't really know how to sell me either. And as everybody knows, selling yourself, you can sell yourself directly yourself, but put people in the middle, they screw up the sale all the time, so they lose the sale half the time anyways. So. In there. So I'm trying to figure out, so, so back to that Fortune 1000, so how as a small business, it's not just to get the logo, I don't care about the logo, I just want to know how as a small business, how can I play in that game so you, as a small business? Yeah, it, it's the length and duration, and I call it the death of a thousand cuts to be certified to sell into a Fortune 1000 company, right? Uh, often you got to have that interface in their SAP or their Ariba system, their, purchase, their purchasing system. Um, my recommendation would be talk to your end customers and find out who are kind of their top two or three uh, value-added resellers or VARs and then strike a deal with them, uh, those VARs, as to, okay, you get 10% if you do nothing but fulfillment. You get 15% if you do the following three things. You get 25%, and these, I'm picking numbers out of thin air, right? If you do these following five things, so that there's, you know, not, they, they have to do something to get more out of it, and you'd be surprised that they're, they're gonna do that, and the procurement, most of the procurement folks will, will tell you who their top two or three uh, that they deal with are easy to deal with, and if you can find somebody who's got a unique niche with that, you know, whether, you know, they, uh, you know, a lot of uh, federal, state, local, federal government, like a minority business enterprise or a woman business enterprise, if you got somebody like that, that you can funnel it through. I have a question for the audience. Is you know, is this the why is the uh, Fortune 500, Fortune 1000 company such an, a magic elixir? I'm I'm working to try to to better understand that from from some of you. Well, if, if I can answer, my what I do is my if uh, what my company does 
is specifically to tran it's transforming businesses that that on the top line these are the customers out there and I used to work for one of these big partners of theirs that used to do that but I, out of my own I still partner with them and like you said I partner with them but there's so many other partners it's in the IT world there's so many other big partners out there that do this thing and to make a relationship with these giant giant resellers is just as hard to go that same route so 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 let me ask you a follow-up follow yeah. question. So I'm CEO of Fortune 1000 Corp, and I'm coming to you to provide me a solution for whatever it is that you, that, that you do or that you serve. Under what circumstance do you tell me no that I can't help you? I never tell you no. Why? Uh, um, because that's... I mean, why would I tell you no? If you want to buy something from me, I'll find a way to sell it to you. When we were talking earlier, do you believe there is good business and bad business? Yeah, absolutely. I have some customers. Yeah, there's no, good business and bad business. Yeah. Uh, you know, you don't want to be chasing bad business, right? It's kind of go down to uh, Bentonville, Arkansas, and uh, ah. Li Little Rock. Stand in their parking lot outside the uh, their vendor facility. And the, fir the best and worst day of a sales rep's life is when they land Walmart. Because huge, you know, huge revenue stream, but they're going to tell you how you're going to sell to them, when you're going to sell to them, what you're, you know, if you sell them this plastic cup, they're going to say, okay, I know you want to sell it to me today for three cents, but I, what do you pay for the plastic in that? Oh, a cent and a half. Why? Well, I, I got a supplier to sell it to you for a penny. And then the guy who, you know, does the molding, what's he charge you? They'll tell you what you're going to end up selling to them for in six months. So the, you know, it's the old good business, bad business, but um, we could, I'd like to talk to you offline because there's some different ways, especially with the IT space, that you can get to uh, those large fortune, you know, 1,000 companies. Yeah, that'd be great. But there is one piece of your question, though, that I think is important. I see a lot of small businesses that are really anxious to get these value-added resellers, and they like, I just opened up a new channel. They've got 130 sales reps. Well, that's 130 people that you somehow now have to convince to sell what you have instead of the other 300 things they have on the shelf that they're selling to that same customer. There is a lot of marketing, sales training, all of the same sales operations that you have to do to have those sales reps in your own house. You have to provide that to your channel partners. Otherwise, you're just sitting on the shelf because the other things are easier to sell, easier to move, <laughs> and they're going to move those things first, whatever you can sell first. There's something gnawing at me about your your thinking along you know on long sales is and maybe I can express it. So we had a large company that came to us, invited us in, you know, when when we were still you know scaling and that's something that we're obviously continuing to do. And the you know, and they invited us in to sit down and talk to them about sales operations because they knew what it was. They were a you know, big giant company. You would instantly know them if I if I talked about you know what they were. And the immediate response is that's not going to serve you. We're not you know our company at this point in time is too small. You know we don't have enough resources to commit to to being able to serve you properly. And I guess my point in, in that is, is that you're not in business to sell things. Of course we love new customers, of course we love revenue, but that's a natural involvement through the value that we bring. And so the first thing that we ask ourselves before we go on an event, can we truly help this customer? Can we truly bring value? And then we hold ourselves accountable. You know, so yeah, we say we can bring value, but how do we do that? And at the point that, you know, sometimes we're in engagement with, with a client and we realize, you know, that they could be better served elsewhere. But then, you know, that builds, because sales is about what? One word. Trust. Trust. That's right. And at the point that you know, our customer base trusts us, then they start referring us, and then we have a reputation for integrity. We have, a, but more importantly, we have a reputation for adding value. And the customer knows; they know through you know their interaction with us if they feel like we can't bring the requisite value that we will tell them so. And then you know, and so what winds up happening is that not short-term picture, but the long-term picture begins to scale and build our business. 
one point is it sounds like you actually have a margin pricing problem too. If you're not making enough money, that's your problem because you're not selling the value. I sold ERP systems for many years and I sell based on what's the return they make on the investment. Uh, Jim. So oh, I'm sorry, Jim. Uh, you, she's been waiting a long time. I even walked up here. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> Man, I want my question. And Darcella is do, and Darcella does amazing work with veterans. So she's amazing. No, it's like you. sales. You just got to be pay persistent. Him for that too. There you go. Um, so, let's see. Before I walked up here, I had a different question, but you guys keep dropping so much really good knowledge that I've changed my question. So here's my question. First of all, Eric, thank you so much for making the point that um, the millennial generation, although sometimes they get a lot of negative, like, oh, you're coddled, you've been told you're a nice, you know, blah, blah, blah. On the other side of that, this is also a group of people, in my opinion, who have been told that failing is okay, and they keep getting other opportunities to keep winning, and they get nurtured through that process. So it doesn't surprise me at all that they turn out to be leaders who then turn around and nurture through a process. So that's the most positive side of that. Um, my question is this. Before I came into the nonprofit world, I was military and then business. So I came into the nonprofit world with all this business, right? 20 years later, right, I find myself with a lot different nonprofit mindset, which there's a little bit of difference in how nonprofit leaders think about stuff as opposed to business. We have a, an, embarrassment, an embarrassment of riches in that the federal funder that we have gives us almost every single new uh, toy CRM that's out there. New this, new that, we get it all. I have an amazing staff, so again, I'm I'm embarrassed with all these amazing things, who as soon as they see that new diamond, they're taking it and they're running with it. So what I'd like to hear from you is, what is one sentence, one question, one uh, group activity, doesn't matter, that I can do to help center them first, because I do see them trying to then now squeeze our processes into the new toy, right? So I wanna make sure that they're not you know, oh, squirrel, and then they're taking off with this, so, yeah. I mean, the one question I would ask is why? Why do they want to, you know, why do they want to move from the current system to the new system? Why do they think that's going to change an outcome, improve their sales process, number of prospects, conversions, whatever it might be, but just why? My one activity is get rid of the technology and get a whiteboard and have everyone have their markers and what do you want this thing to do and how is it going to help you what do you imagine it to be and you're going to get some really crazy things but you whittle that back to reality and then you can say okay now let's make the system do that so and so what i would maybe say is is that you get people in a room and and they want to start defending something they often you know start in with a litany of statements you know here's all the reasons why we should do this no 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 you know here's all the reasons why and so you know the thing is is people immediately leap to statements what i would offer counsel to all of you is to you know take one step back and say, what is the most important question here? I see confusion, so, you know, the quizzical stare. The, the, the one question I would ask this group would be simply this. What does this new toy do for our customer? Yeah. Because if they can't answer that, you know, let's go party instead of buying the new toy. Or have a pizza, or a whatever. But, if they can't answer what is it going to do for our customer, our prospect, then you know they need to rethink that. And therein lies, you know, again, what is the most important question? And that was the that, that's a you know that's a should be very high up on the list of, of questions. But see how that's different than just launching into a litany of, of of statements about you know what you think should happen because it gets everybody thinking, and that's the that's the main point there. Can I say something here without a question? <laughs> all right, let me ask. Okay, so you know we read all and we subscribe to all these talking heads, right? So, you know, we all know what talking heads are, right? So this one is from a group that I respect, Miller Hyman. Has anybody heard of Miller Hyman? Okay, they're pretty good, right? So they 
sent a survey to all CEOs and what are the th top three barriers that you see impacting your sales organization's ability to achieve your 2018 revenue objectives? What do you think the number one thing is? Salespeople. Yeah. Suboptimal sales manager coaching. <laughs> number one. Number two, difficulty, as you would say, you guys are saying, difficulty differentiating against the competition. Difficulty establishing our product's full ROI. You've all talked about this. You're not different than anybody else, and I love these guys, right? But you, you, it's about people still, it, you know? It's not about the toy, it's about the people. And it's really, if your salespeople are vomiting at the mouth, and they're not adding value, and they're not giving that differentiation, and if you're a leader and you're not coaching them, then shame on you. I see some of you chomping at the bit. All right, Mary, Sorry. I've got one before Mary. Okay, got it, yep. You know, I have one company, and from initial contact, it's 14 months before we close the deal. And they're very high margin and large deals, though. I mean, it's 70% margins, bottom line, after commission. So it's worth that wait. But then I have a consulting company. It's a two-visit close. Because I find, found out 30 years ago, if they're not willing to write a small check, they'll never write a big check. And then that's where you build that trust relationship. Gil helped me many years ago. Uh, sales, management, sales management question. So you're a sales manager, and you got 40 people under you, and you're responsible for forecasting, so you need to know whether the opportunities in all of their pipelines are real. And you're sitting with one salesperson. What question? Do you ask, and I'm hoping I get four answers, the salesperson in front of you to determine whether, frankly, he's full of shit or not? So there's three questions I ask on every funnel review, and I've done thousands of them, right? Why, why us, and why now? If they can't answer those three questions, you don't have an opportunity. I'd say that, sum that sums it up. Uh, the, the other, because it really does, is you know, what's the compelling event for the customer to make a decision? And if, if I hear one or two words, well, uh, I need this to happen, or I hope it, it's going to happen, I know it's a BS opportunity. Right. right. Yeah. And just if you're using a CRM, when's the last activity in that opportunity? And how long has it been uh, an opportunity? And is it just push month to month, quarter to quarter? Is a pretty good indicator that it's a BS opportunity. So, you know, there's 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 coaching, and then there's doing coaching right. And the and I'm going to go right back to you know to what Eric and and, and Greg just expounded on. You know why you know. Why us? Why now? And so the, all those questions are really getting under, you know, understanding, you know, each opportunity and really understanding, you know, the meaning behind that opportunity. And the thing about that is coaching takes time. If you're going to do coaching right, it takes time because it takes time to ask these questions and then to get answers and have discussion around those answers. So you can't bring shortcuts you know, in, you know, to, you know, to the table if you're going to be coaching. You know, it really comes down to asking intelligent questions that spur conversation between you and the representative so that you can uncover you know, essentially is, you know, is this salesperson just running, you know, a line of BS, you know, because they know that they need to come to this meeting and have an answer, or are they substantively doing their job? I agree with everything that these guys have said, but I'm going to take a little bit more of a data and numbers approach because one of the pieces that when I'm working with companies on forecasting, we see a lot of salespeople think it's going to be a $200,000 deal. You're like, well, what was your average deal size last year? Well, 30,000. Well, why is this one going to be 200,000? And so, again, it's a lot about questions, but you can look at historical data if you're talking about the dollars in the pipeline and whether or not they've overstated the amount of dollars that each account is worth by looking at historical data. And lots of times you can ask this. So last year you worked with, you know, a key competitor to that client 
buy it and how much did you think they were going to buy? They'll tell you a number and it might not be, you can look at the number of what that actual account was. You're going to be able to measure how much they overestimate contract values by on an individual by individual basis. So one of the clients I'm working with right now, they've got one salesperson that measures to overestimate the size of contracts by 23%. And they have another guy that es overestimates it by more than 200% on a consistent basis. So, <laughs> you know, just as we're talking to each of them, trying to figure out what the forecast really is, um, you know, we can look historically. I'm going to add on to my other, other comment is, you know, I can always spot a manager that is ineffective at coaching people when they're constantly telling them what the salesperson, what they need to be doing. You know, coaching is about a conversation. It's about enrollment. It's not about, you know, this is what you need to be doing. Dump, a dump, a dump, a dump, a dump. Because that goes, you know, it either goes in one ear and out the other, or the salesperson is so intimidated they lead the conversation knowing what they need to do, but they have no direction on how to, how to accomplish it. The other thing too is um, it's, it's still the old 80-20 rule, right? And uh, this is, uh, I've seen managers, all managers, and I've fallen into myself. Do you spend 80% of your time with the bottom 20% uh, or 80% of your time with the bottom 20% per, uh, performers? Or do you spend 80% of your time with the top 20% performers? We all as managers love to go out and, you know, have the, the sign the big deal, go have a nice steak and a nice bottle of wine, but that probably was going to happen with or without your participation in it. And how much more can you really drive with that performer versus the same, you know, another performer has probably got the same goal. Excellent point. But is running at 20% of their number. That's you you need to, point. you know, help that person with their sales methodology and get better at it or you know, help them figure out, is this really the right gig for them? In support of what Greg just said, I can't remember the attribution, but you know, it's just trust me on this, right? Quote, unquote. Um, you know, sale, top performing salespeople perform at twice the level of an average performing sales representative. They perform at 10 times the level of underperforming sales representatives. You've already got so many headcounts, so many slots, right? So you might as well make sure they're all being productive. Who's next? So just following up on that, I've heard something slightly different where you should be focusing on the middle performers. You've got your top performers who don't necessarily need your help, but those middle performers, getting them up to that top performance level is more effective time management wise than taking those lowest performers to try to just get them up to that mid-tier level. You guys experience I totally agree with you. Totally agree with you. So my philosophy is a, and I'm a player, and God love the A players of the world, right? They're very hard to replicate, by the way. Very, very hard to replicate. And oh, by the way, most organizations could not have 20 A players. It would be absolute chaos, right? Um, but on the other end of the spectrum, if you have a fully defined D player, get him or her out of your organization now. Get them out today. Don't waste a penny more and don't even, don't even go to their HR, just fire them. Because you've labeled them as a D player. A D player to me is non-recoverable. A D player to me is someone that doesn't really want to be here. Right, everybody has different qualifications for Ds. But to your point, the B's and C's are your gold, absolute gold. Because there's typically new people maybe, or somebody new in the market, or I don't know. The, the, the B's and C's, if you nurture and coach right, they're great. The, I agree with exactly what Eric said, but I'm gonna add a caveat to that is, you know. Go through your HR. Right? <laughs> 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 well, then. Uh, HR here, I, I should. Have a good attorney. The only thing that I would add to that, you know, beyond the HR standpoint, is to actually make sure that they are a D player, because I have managed, you know, 
50 plus sales representatives at, at a time and you know and there's been a few where I have thought D player but as I went and had conversations with them and I learned to understand what the impediments and roadblocks were to their production, like literally one was a slow computer and you know, came back to me as I'm not making sales because I have a slow computer. And I'm thinking to myself, well, if this isn't the, the, the biggest BS you know, excuse. But, you know, but the thing is, is you know, I take the, you know, the first round of that at face value. I go out personally, you know, even not our, I didn't send my supervisor, I sent me because I'm the leader of the, of, of the group. I personally sat down with them and it didn't take me long to realize, man, your computer is slow and I, you know, they can't move through the calls because every time that they're you know, wanting to, you know, to, to move to the next screen, click, 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 click. We changed their computer and all of a sudden you know, sales production you know, went dramatically up. Now. In most cases, it's not like that. In most cases, if you've identified a D player, they're more than likely a D player. But that would be the only cautionary point is just make sure that they are. Yeah. Well, and that's, you know, the bottom 20, 30%, I think most managers, the only time, the only interaction they have with them is on that weekly call or the pipeline review, and they don't spend time with them figuring out are they, you know, are, are they worth saving, or do I need to make it apparent to them that they're, this is probably not the right role for them? And you know, I, I would say more than 75% of the folks I've had to manage out were relieved when they got managed out. Yeah. They're like, you know what, this rewrite, this was not a right fit for me, Absolutely. and I'm happier off doing something else. Now it may take them a while to figure that out, but long term they are. And so one thing, and I know Eric does this when he's on engagement, is this that he's you don't know, you don't make those decisions by the numbers. You know, Eric emphasized people. Greg emphasized people. Tara's emphasized people. You make that decision by going out and spend. Coaching is hard. It's time consuming. It, as a leader, it means getting out with your people and basically understanding what they're doing when they're on a sales call. That's how you know not you know numbers support that but if you're just looking at numbers to make that determination you're you're potentially building in massive blind spots I encourage any CEO or VP in the audience whether it's marketing operations or whatever is listen to some phone calls it's very enlightening you know ask your salesperson to pitch you just ask them to pitch you or her to pitch you Right? It's very, it's a very enlightening, you know? But I mean, the good ones practice this. I mean, whether they're A, B, Cs, they, it's a profession, they do this. Well, and if nine out of 10, uh, you're leaving a voicemail, you shouldn't stutter. You should have that memorized. On a large sales behavior assessment company started in 1996, we were 85% accurate on hiring on whether they would make it in sales and also customer service. So we had 1,000 people in the call center, 2,500. And the selection process is very critical. But then on our, my smaller clients, I get rid of the Ds and Cs. Then I get administrative help for the A so they can perform even better. Yeah. Reinvest the money where you should. Uh, do we have more questions, please? And feel free if you want to grab a beer. We've got one, but we want to make sure we cover the questions. We have plenty of time, but go back and have a beer if you want one. Thank you. Um, I got a, a quick question. It's actually a two-parter. And sometimes it seems like there's a disconnect between the sales managers and their sales people that one is, is when you reach that sales goal, is why then do some organizations automatically increase that goal from the year before? When it took every ounce of effort and your A player got to that 100% mark, reached his goal, and now they bump it up to 125%. The second one is, the second one is, is a blanket sales goal throughout your region, territory, or country when there's different dynamics in every region. So 
there should be specific goals for specific territories. I'm going to wait to answer this one. Cause well, that's where the science of sales comes in. If you're doing the metrics, you'll know that. I bite my tongue. <laughs> so the 25%, you're probably a, that's probably a publicly traded company because, right, the, that's expected by Wall Street. So that's often what drives that behavior. Um, to your point, uh, so. Is it, is it, it's, it's attainable year after year after year. It's but it's, it, you know, it, it most, I come from primarily from the 30 plus years in the, on the publicly traded side for, you know, high tech companies. And it was either grow, because if you don't grow, you're shrinking, which means your competitors are growing and you're going to be out of business. So it was just, you know, it was always double digit growth year over year. Um, but to your point, the, the second part of your question, I never, in the 30 plus years I've been doing it, if all four of us sat here, I would never just say, go, goals, goals $12 million, you get three, I get three, you get three, you get three. Because, th you know, maybe a time, maybe his uh, dressable market, maybe it's six million bucks really. Maybe he should be getting six million out of it. Maybe what I've got is really a million dollar market, and if I'm getting three out of it, you know, I'm 300%. I'm so you really, you gotta look at it, and. It used to be more of a, a, you know, throwing a dart at a dartboard, but now with all the data that's available, you can back into some metrics and assign some goals based upon some, some you know, certain analytics and data points. So my, my response to your question, um, you know, while I'm not going to apply this universally, it's, you know, and, and maybe not even in majority terms, but at least in some of those cases, it's just simply because the sales management team doesn't know what they're doing. They don't watch them. Know what they're doing. Or they're lazy. I mean, I've, yeah. I've, you know, I've seen folks do that. Oh, I got $12 million, you get three, you get three, you get three. Everybody's happy, right? <laughs> Let's go have a beer. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a response to that? My only thought was on the increase by 25%. I kind of had a question for you is, do you retain sales and account management growth with the existing customers, or is it 125, or is it a 25% increase in new business? And so for different... So, so if you've already got the developed customers and you're trying to increase with other product or raise their all new business yeah so that that's one of the things I mean I'm not saying 25% doesn't sound right yeah yeah so I got out of it hold on I got Ned lips back <laughs> <laughs> well, there, that's 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 just it. That's you know, is top performing salespeople get ticked off at that, and then they leave the the organization, right? That's that's a very real consequence of of poor sales management. So one of the interesting one of the things he brought up an interesting thing, and some people did. I find that an impediment to some of the large organizations I've been in is an inability to get to cross sell between entities or professionals or parts of the organization because this guy over here has the relationship with the client and I'll be darned if I'm going to risk that relationship by introducing them to this group of people that run this deal or this group of people that have this. How as sales managers, when you have an opportunity to try and make that happen, do you get people to share their connection points? So one of the beauties of CRM is that exact application. We call it white space marketing. I understand. Okay. I've heard CRMs, they will hide their clients somewhere deep in the CRM so no one can find them. So this is all about management again, sales management. But I mean, if your goal is to cross sell or upsell inside, you know, a Chevron or a Philips or some behemoth like that, you have to have a strategy and a plan. So typically when, when people come to us on that, we want to adopt an enterprise planning or enterprise strategy within the organization. And that takes a lot of work, right? So one of the clients I took on, first month they, I took them on, they lost five of their top 10 clients. 
That's why my hair goes white, right? So my point was, is why did they, why did they lose their clients? They didn't have any plan. They were working with, uh, one client was Pioneer. I don't know if you know Pioneer in Dallas. They're huge, right? Pioneer, the guy had one contact in Pioneer and it represented 12 million bucks to them. Right, so there's no planning, right? So planning on the enterprise side is a huge thing. It's a lot of conversations, it's a lot of teamwork, and it's a, f it's a lot of work. But <laughs> it pays off. There's no, I mean, there's no easy way around, uh, at least I don't know of any easy way around that. Yeah. Well, it, it, it comes back to, you take, and salespeople are unique animals. Uh, typically, to your point, right, very possessive. Anybody touch any of my stuff, I kill you, right? <laughs> don't come in, it's my, it's my account, right? Nobody comes in unless I open the doors. So, you know, I've seen uh, both approaches over the years of a carrot or a stick. Carrot is, hey, you know, if you sell, you know, we bring in a new product line, if you sell that product, instead of making, you know, 1x on it, you make 2x or 3x on it. Or uh, you assign, okay, a new product line comes in, 10% uh, of your goal has to hit that, and until you sell 10% of your goal with that product line, you don't get into accelerators. I mean, it just it depends on how you want how you want to craft it and how the you know typically people react more to the carrot because the salesperson looks at it and says, "I sell a million bucks on this, I make ten grand. I sell a million bucks of that, I make thirty grand. I'm going to at least try that." I'll say um, one of the things that I always find interesting is that people think that because this salesperson has sold that account before. We're going to just make a new product and say, yeah, no, now go push it, push it to that client. But they don't develop the same level of messaging and process and operations. They think that because it's an existing client that you don't have to go through the same effort of explaining the value and educating the customer for why they want the new thing. Just because they bought yellow from you doesn't mean that all of a sudden you created blue and now you're going to tell them, hey, buy blue too. Right? You have to still go through the same operational process with your existing customers. So customer marketing is a huge thing right now where your expansion of existing accounts is your lowest cost of sale and a huge opportunity if you're adding new product lines or cross-selling. So along Eric's point of view, I kind of view it and I describe it to a lot of people as a tree with a lot of roots you have to have a lot of people that you're talking to in those organizations because that customer is so important, is so important to your company that in order to keep that stable relationship, you have to have lots of roots into the organization. And there's ways as managers, and these guys know better than me, how to get the sales teams to work together to share their contacts in an organization. but. I mean, that's rough. And from a customer marketing standpoint, though, you can't skimp on the operations just because they're already a customer who's bought from you once. You know, I found with big 10 accounting firms coaching them, they're highly analytical and they get in and close a deal. They hate sales and analytical people are risk adverse. They won't bring in other people because they're afraid it'll screw up the account. If you're selling to CIOs, they want to talk to subject matter experts. They don't want to talk to a sales rep because they want to get the information. I'd have multiple sales calls. And then lastly, though, if you look at an Oracle, I have friends at Oracle, you know, they'll throw 25 people at MasterCard of Monsanto and whoever gets whatever gets it I mean it's you know survival to fit us there I got this one and then we got there come right back. Uh, so my question is around uh, sales process and uh, revenue predictability in an environment or for a company where the solution tends to be highly integrated or customized um, and or for smaller companies where uh, you have a minimal, minimally viable product, but it's not its full, you know, breadth of where you're going from a product point of view. How, how, what's what's your thought process on selling more of a kind of a individualized custom solution and still having predictable revenue? 
I think the biggest fallacy people have with that is they get a deal in the pipeline, well, we're going to close it. I've never seen a sales funnel, I've never gone through a funnel review that's either three to four to one. And the smaller you are and the more complex the deal, it, the, the ratios go up. It's the same with your lead, somebody asked about leads. I've never seen a ratio of more than four leads out of 10 being good, six are trash, right? But you gotta constantly have a sales funnel to support that one deal at the end of the quarter if your quarter is the measurement, right? So my only advice is you focus on the key activities that drive the new opportunities. Never take your foot off the accelerator on the front end. Whether it's social media, whether it's content, whether it's inbound, outbound, whatever, never take your, your foot off that pedal because that will kill you. Yeah, it sounds like you've got very lumpy business, right? Um, so if you've got very lumpy business, to Eric's point, you're going to have to have a funnel to make sure that you've got enough deals in the pipeline that when you, you got your, and I agree, three to four to one at a minimum is, is typically what you see, and you've got enough leads to create that three to four uh, to one pipeline creation on it. The other thing you can look at if it's, if it's really lumpy like that is, uh, is there a way that you can make that that product as opposed to a one and done a more of a subscription base or something that has a recurring revenue to it so at least you've got a run rate of revenue that keeps the lights on for you and you can you know take the the lumpy revenue model with it well and then the other thing that I would maybe add to all of that is is you know what criteria do you have in place for being able to score the lead because it's incredibly inefficient is if you don't know what's a good lead and what's not a good lead and now that forces you to have to pursue all the leads to see what shakes out whereas if you have very defined criteria that's mapped to your sales process that you know to to basically evaluate properly because anybody can evaluate leads and put a you know and put a sit that doesn't necessarily mean it's effective right but to have you know proper evaluation of the leads so that you know which leads to be able to to effectively pursue and which leads to let go especially if six of them are going to be essentially junk is that how you want to be spending your time pursuing junk so I know there's a lot of early stage folks in here and this long-tailed consultative sales cycle is a challenge when you're introducing a new technology or something that's very customized in the marketplace. One of the things that I consistently see, I cannot agree more, is you have to know who your ideal customer is and don't try to sell and force fit a solution or tailor a solution to someone who's not going to be profitable for you and not going to get the most value out of what you're doing. Um, but the other piece too is make sure the you're charging enough to cover that cost of sale. Those, the consultative sales are incredibly expensive and high labor and they're long process. So you better make sure that your pricing strategy allows you to survive that you're gonna be able to not only sell but start to implement that custom solution and be able to cover your operating costs because you either need to have a lot of people selling because it takes so much time and effort to sell the custom solution and then implement it and that's a big burn rate. So <laughs> yeah, I see that a lot with companies that are doing this consultative sale and they'll tell me the lifetime value of their customer is 10 grand. I'm like, don't do it. <laughs> I was like, you're out of business, I, you know, you can say. So make sure you're looking at that as well. well two, right, we have two more questions. We, so our commitment is to end on time. So we actually have time for one more question, and then we'll do golden nuggets, and I'll explain that in a moment. Okay. All uh, right. Speaking of big eight accounting firms. Five, global. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, interested in your um, thoughts on using an external lead generation company to set up C-level appointments? So I'm very opinionated, so if you want me to shut up, I'll shut up. <laughs> Be really careful. If it's a very, very, very technical or very, very complicated or very, very, whatever very is, <laughs> value prop, if you're going to go to an outside firm, make sure they're in your house. Hey, 
Okay. Because outside firms that I've worked with, and I think we've all worked with them, they overpromise and sometimes underdeliver. You know? And you're, you're going to pay a fortune for some of this stuff, right? I mean, I've seen bills sixty, a hundred thousand dollars a month for outside firms. You know. The question I would ask is, why do you have to go to an outside firm to get that? A lot of people do. Yeah, yeah but I, I can give you a Rolodex and get you the appointment, but it may not be. Well, the other question that I would ask is, how are you measuring ROI off this in the first place? That's, that's the corresponding question that I would tie with it. I mean, you know, if it's producing the right ROI, you know, then, you know, then hey, that's you know, it's a great thing to do. I'm, I'm all about, you know, outsourcing certain, certain things. But if it's like Eric says, it's, if it's complex sale, they don't have the necessary in-house expertise to be able to deliver an effective value communication, and that's not just a statement, that's a back and forth conversation, and it's producing, you know, low ROI, mm -hmm. that kind of tells you evidence-based decision of, you know, of probably where you need to go. Eric, oh. wouldn't, wouldn't you agree that if you use an outside firm for that, you'd have to have an extremely compelling message for that to... For you so to some of the outside ROI. firms have really gone to sophisticated playbooks, I will say that, right? And, 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 and they've done that. But, you know, two things that I would say. I mean, I'm not saying all are bad, but some are, you know, some are really reputable, right? And they'll work with you. But they're not cheap. I'm just, okay? But work with them. You've got to work with them. You've got to listen to calls. You've got to make sure that they sample X amount of calls for you, X amount of appointments for you, X amount of whatever. And I think it's really good that somebody from your staff is there during training if you can't bring them in-house. And I think you, and, and, the, and <laughs> the big thing you have to negotiate is the contract. So, and, and a lot of people view the contract as, well, we've created an awareness, therefore it's a lead. I don't think so. Yeah. Well, I will tell you too, just to add to this, because I completely agree, there are reasons why you would outsource things and there are reasons why you'd bring it in-house and you need to determine the ROI of that decision. However, many, many companies outsource things that they don't know how to do themselves and then they that. think they can somehow manage it. And so to Eric's point, you have to manage those outside vendors. And if you have no clue how to accomplish what they're doing or how to measure whether or not it's producing results, then you need to have someone you know, bring in a group inside that can be managed by your internal sales management or you need to bring in a consultant who can actually manage the integration of that outsourced vendor with your team. So it's now time for Golden Nuggets. We've already heard a little bit today about, you know, you've said so many great things. Consider what you heard today that was of value. So I'm going to ask you in a moment what that specifically is. But first, our panelists will have 30 seconds to share their golden nuggets from today's presentation. We'll begin with Ryan Bresch. I'm, I'm shy. I'm a wallflower. I have nothing to say. Um, <clears throat> no, golden nugget. It's, you know, I think the golden nugget is, is, is basically that when we look at sales management, sales operations, you know, it's, you know, there's kind of the sirens call. I mean, I think it's really, you know, from my understanding, please somebody correct me if I'm wrong, it's, you know, but Washington University, one of the top schools, you know, certainly in the entire Midwest, um, you know, if not the United States, you know, if you look at their MBA program, they have marketing, they cover human resources, org development, they don't cover sales management. And I think what companies are finding more and more is that sales management is, you know, in and of itself, is just as substantive of and just as in depth of a topic as, you know, has anything marketing, organizational development, human resources related. Yeah, I think this panel has really touched on the key points that all of the parts 
have to be working together. The, the management is really important because you can have great salespeople and if they don't have good management, they won't perform. And if you have good outsourced vendors but you don't have good management, you can't hold them accountable. And we've talked a lot about process and data today, but we cannot emphasize enough, and I'm pretty sure the whole panel will agree, that the people are critically important. You can have all the process, data, systems, toys you want, and if you don't have the right people that are trained and coached to accomplish what you need, then it won't produce any results. Great. Uh, unfortunately, my goal tonight is I have no silver bullet for you. If I did, I would not be sitting here. I'd be sitting on some island that I own. But uh, <laughs> um, to, to follow to really what Tara said, it's sales is a person-to-person -person engagement, and um, there is you know I, I've been amazed by some folks I looked at and said he or she will never be successful in sales. And they've been some of the best salespeople I've ever met. And part of it, a lot of it went back to they just were persistent and consistent in their methodology is how they approached it. And they knew that, hey, I got to have a three to four one pipeline or I need, you know, 20 leads to get a, uh, a, a good lead out of it. They just were very persistent and consistent uh, in their approach. Eric. The golden nugget is you guys. Keep asking these questions. Right, you got to keep asking these questions. There's a lot of organizations where you ask a VP of sales a question and he says, why should I answer you? Keep asking the questions, right? Uh, the questions you're asking today are all what I hear with my clients, so you're not unique, right? You got to keep asking the questions. Today, Tara shared, 57% of prospects make a decision to buy before you ever talk to them. That was an aha moment for me. So. We take this now to you again as setting up before we begin a discussion post perfectus. What did you see today? What, what value did you have? And we're just going to do this very quickly. Who'd like to share? Sales is about trying to convince someone. Sales is not about trying to convince someone. Great. Who else? You saw no value? <laughs> yes, ma'am. How much uh, product differentiation mm -hmm. was a key problem for sales? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so pr product differentiation, Gene, you want to say more about that? Okay. Got a nice hand back here. I would say uh, planning the sales process is very important. Got it. Yeah, you in the blue. Yeah, a little louder. Uh, yeah, it's, it's important not to just go for the logos, really understand the customers that have the, the problem that you're trying to solve. Oh, yes, ma'am. Coming to you right now. I just want to give a shout out to Dorsella and VetBiz at Twitter, at, at VetBiz on Twitter, because she made my job so easy as the person who took on Twitter for MVF tonight. All I had to do was retweet all the fabulous things. She has every key takeaway is in our Twitter feed right now, both at, at MVF STL and at Love at that. Vetbiz. Love that. So whatever else you took from the presentation tonight, consider that as, as we begin to dialogue. Post-Perfectus. So on behalf of the panelists today and everyone working behind the scenes at Perfectus, thank you for participating in today's session. We look forward to your feedback at the gathering following. You may visit us online at perfectusstl.com. It's been an honor to be your moderator today and I'll leave you with a fitting quote because I saw a lot of courageousness tonight in standing up and asking questions where maybe you didn't want to. Take risks. If you win, you'll be happy. If you lose, you'll be wise. I'm John Lanius. We hope to see you again at another Perfectus Business Symposium. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Let's give a big round of applause.